Welcome to our regular Bible study program. This is Tuesday, October the 24th. Thank you for joining us. We're always glad to have God's people studying the Word of God, looking deep into it, and asking questions. And hopefully we can answer some of those questions in this session here tonight. But we always start with a brief prayer. And as I said last week, I think it's appropriate for our prayer to be for peace in the Middle East. There's a scripture in the book of Psalms that says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And uh, would love to see peace in the Middle East. You can't make peace with, with Hamas as they're d determined to destroy you. But I'd like to see some type of peace uh, in that land and protection for the innocents. So that's a matter that I think we could include in our prayer and whatever else the Lord may lay upon your heart. But briefly, we just want to pray that the Lord will help us as we look into his word. Our dear righteous Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace, for your plan of salvation. Thank you for this Bible that you've given us as you've explained this wonderful gospel, this good news, this plan of salvation. Thank you for our Savior who bore our sins and transferred his righteousness to us. We appreciate that. And Lord, I do pray for the Middle East right now, the land of Israel, uh, God's people that are there. Uh, they are under attack. There are so many innocents that are dying, so much bloodshed, so much horror. Lord, I would like to see peace. I am going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and peace in the land of Israel, asking you to intervene in whatever way is right. Lord, I pray that you would touch our minds here tonight as we delve into your word. Give us that understanding that we need to appreciate what a great salvation we have, what a great Savior we serve. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me if I cough or have to clear my throat. I'm still recovering from a bit of a head cold that I developed after my return from Israel. But I have several questions that have already been submitted tonight, yet if you have a question that's burning on your heart that you would like us to try to answer live, you can submit it as a comment to this Facebook page. Uh, otherwise, if you want to give me a little time to consider and study on that question, you can submit it later as a message to this page or a comment again to this post later. But I'll start in. The first question asks me, is it acceptable to repeat the Lord's Prayer in every beginning and at the end of every church service. Well, I'll tell you, the Lord's Prayer is really more of a sample prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. We often quote it out of the sixth chapter of Matthew, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You know, that, that prayer. When it's recorded in the 11th chapter of Luke, it's when the disciples asked the Lord, teach us how to pray. And so he gave them a sample or an outline. I'm not sure that he intended for them to quote it verbatim every time. I think he was just showing them the things that need to be included in a good prayer. Um, and really, in my mind, the Lord's Prayer is the one he prayed in the 17th chapter of the book of John. It's a prayer for the church, a prayer for the work of the Lord, a prayer for the people of God. If you want to know how Jesus prayed, read the 17th chapter of John. But the idea of repeating verbatim the Lord's Prayer at the beginning and the end of every service is interesting. I, I think there are times when it might be appropriate to recite what we call the Lord's Prayer word for word, but to make it routine, to say it at the beginning and the end of every service, in my opinion, seems a little too much. There's a danger that it'll just become vain repetition. Uh, people won't really focus on praying to God. They're just going to recite the same words every time without really thinking about the meaning of those words. Jesus said in Matthew chapter uh, 6 uh, and verse 7, I think I may have earlier said that the Lord's Prayer was in Matthew 7, but it's in Matthew 6. But before he gave that prayer, he said in verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. You see, prayer needs to come from the heart. It's a meaningful conversation that you're having with the Lord in heaven. If you just repeat words without thinking, you're not really communicating with your heavenly Father. Uh, 
merely merely reciting the same words over and over, like maybe quoting a poem that you don't even understand, that's not really a religious act of worship. I don't think we should have any routine ritualistic practices in the body of Christ. Every one of our church services is unique, and I feel that every prayer ought to fit the circumstances that brought us to the throne of grace. There are immediate needs and ever-changing prayer requests. And so our submission and our praise to the Lord ought to be spontaneous, but I think our prayers ought to be somewhat spontaneous in that they're not just rote recitations of the same words. When Jesus warned about vain repetitions there in Matthew 6 and verse 7, it wasn't warning against repetition. He was warning against vain repetition. In Greek, it's a single word, batologeo, one word that's translated as vain repetitions. And it means to repeat the same thing over and over using idle words or just babbling or prating on. It carries the connotation of just empty words or words that are spoken without real thought. Now, it's okay to repeat your prayer request. Keep asking the Lord until he answers. He even gave us a parable about an unjust judge and a woman who just kept petitioning. And it's okay to repeat your prayers, but make sure they're sincere and well thought out and from the heart and not just to some words that you memorized and you can recite without even har hardly thinking about them. So, while I don't mean to criticize a church that, that opens and ends every service quoting the Lord's Prayer, I just say that for our assembly here in Des Moines, that's not something we would do because it has the da danger of just becoming rote and vain repetitions. <clears throat> So my next question asks, does the eagle represent America in Bible prophecy? Well, eagles have always symbolized freedom and strength and power. Uh, they're considered somewhat the kings of the sky, and they've been adopted as the symbol of seven, several ancient cultures, including Rome. Uh, Rome wanted to use the eagle as the symbol of their leadership and immortality, and on their standards, they would have an eagle at the top. And the United States declared the bald eagle to be its national bird all the way back in 1792 because an eagle has a long lifespan and a very majestic presence. But remember, eagles were also unclean animals under God's law. In Leviticus 11 and verse 13, they're included in the list of animals that are unclean. That's because they're carnivores. They would tear the flesh from their prey and eat it raw. And... Like Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 28, he said, For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. What he meant was they would feast on a dead body of some animal that had been killed. Um, and in the Bible, eagles often do symbolize power, sometimes good power, sometimes evil power. God used the imagery of an eagle to give warnings to Israel and to other nations. For example, Obadiah 1 and verse 4 is a prophecy against the nation of Edom. It says, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Edom thought it was strong like an eagle, but the Lord was going to bring them down. And Jeremiah 49, 22 is also a prophecy about Edom. It says, Behold he, the Lord, shall come up and fly as the eagle, and spread his wings over Basra. And in that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom be as the heart of a woman in her pains. So the Lord's going to be like an eagle. In other verses, uh, he chooses the bird to represent something powerful and unstoppable to show his sovereign control over everything. And Isaiah 40 and verse 31 is the verse that most people are familiar with that refers to eagles. It says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. I believe that's a reference to glorified bodies in the millennium, but uh, that mounting up with wings as eagles is a phrase that people 
a lot of people know. But personally, I don't think there's any prophecy in the Bible that utilizes an eagle to represent the United States of America. Now, Revelation 12 and verse 14 says that the woman who gave birth to the man-child, and that woman represents the body of Christ, it says she will be given wings of a great eagle to fly into a place in the wilderness to escape the wrath of the serpent. And some Bible students have suggested that those wings of a great eagle may represent America airlifting Jews out of Israel for safety in the Battle of Armageddon. Or maybe it's air support in that battle. But I believe that's really quite a stretch. For one thing, I don't think the woman in Revelation 12 is a representation of Israel or the Jewish people. I believe it's a representation of the body of Christ that gave birth to the man-child, which is the bride of Christ that's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So even if Revelation 12 is a future prophecy, and one that's not already been fulfilled when the early church went into the wilderness, I still don't see how that can be America helping God's people. It seems to me that America is getting more and more ungodly. <clears throat> it's becoming more beastly and more anti-Christian. I don't think we can look to America as that eagle. The Lord told the Hebrews back in the book of Exodus, Exodus 19 and verse 4, he said, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He wasn't saying that a nation represented by an eagle brought the Hebrews out of slavery. Rather, it was his power. He was the eagle's wings that saved them from Egyptian slavery and brought them out toward the promised land. The eagle's wings were the Lord doing mighty signs and miracles and bringing plagues down on Egypt. That was the eagle's wings then. And I think it'll be that way at the end of Gentile times. I don't think the Lord's going to preserve the remnant of the church by some nation. I don't think he will preserve Israel by some nation. But rather, he's going to use the same means that he used in the Exodus. He's going to use signs and miracles, and plagues, including the seven last plagues of the wrath of God. And I believe the, it's the Lord who's going to bear the remnant of the church to a place of safety after the rapture, which is depicted as the man-child being caught up to God in Revelation 12 and verse 5. I just have trouble finding any significant prophetic role for the United States in Bible prophecies. Maybe it's there and I'm just not seeing it but I can only answer as I understand the scriptures. <clears throat> Next question after thanking me for the Bible study, it says, through scientific advancement, it is becoming more likely that man can alter weather patterns. How does that fit into Bible prophecy? And can it be weaponized and used one nation against another? Well, i got to start by saying that the Lord has control of the weather. Uh, Nahum 1 and verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. His control over the weather was demonstrated when Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves on the Sea of Galilee, and the winds became calm. It's recorded several times, but Mark 4.39 says, And he arose and rebuked the winds, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Certainly the Lord controls the weather, or can control the weather. But can man... When man attempts to control the weather, it's called geoengineering. That's the term used to describe the manipulation of the weather. And as modern technology advances and our understanding of meteorological processes grows, I believe scientists are really trying to develop ways to control the weather. Instead of just succumbing to nature's schedule, there's projects in place to make the skies calm, prevent a lot of those storms, 
uh, to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and to prevent extreme weather events like hurricanes and floodings. I seriously doubt that man will ever get complete control over the weather so as to be able to prevent storms and hurricanes and tornadoes. But I think man will acquire some ability to decrease or diminish the detrimental effects of global warming and climate change. But I don't think man will wrest control of the weather from God's hands. I think it's kind of interesting that in Job, the first chapter, it was the devil, the god of this world and the prince of the power of the air, who exercised control over weather events. Job 1 and verse 16 says that fire from heaven, like lightning, uh, fell and was very destructive. And in verse 19, there was a very destructive wind. Storms were, were the work of the devil in, in that chapter. And like I said, when Jesus rebuked the winds, that was the work of the Lord. So I think there's times when weathering events are subject to supernatural control. But probably most of the time, our weather is just the result of natural forces that are part of our world under the curse. Rain is the product of evaporation, cooling, condensation, and precipitation. The wind blows because air moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And then they're swept along, those high pressures and low pressure systems are swept along by the winds. It's all part of what we call nature, or some people call mother nature. And given time, man might be able to have some influence on the weather through geoengineering, but probably never complete control. And it's an interesting question, can geoengineering be weaponized? And I have to say absolutely, it already has been. Cloud seeding is a method that's used to make, make it rain, make the clouds produce rain. Using aircraft or drones or rockets, uh, small particles of either silver or lead iodide are released into the sky. Because those particles are similar in structure to ice, the water droplets that are in clouds, small droplets that are too small to fall as rain, they'll begin to surround that silver iodide or that um, uh, lead iodide. And as the water and the silver iodide combine, they form ice crystals. And eventually those ice crystals become too heavy to remain suspended in a cloud. And they start to fall and the ice melts and they become raindrops. You can seed the clouds and cause it to rain. Can that be weaponized? Well, absolutely. In 1974, during the Vietnam War, the U.S. Army used cloud seeding to alter the weather in Vietnam. Their aim was to prolong the monsoon seasons there in Vietnam to make fighting more difficult for their enemy. That plan was called Operation Popeye. And it meant that the U.S. troops were prepared for the extensive rainy season, and the enemy was not. Um, there's, there's documents about this posted by the Office of Historian. Um, but Operation Popeye used rain as a weapon to destroy roads, flood rivers, and hinder the adversaries from advancing. And in order to do that, military ply military pilots flew over chosen areas with canisters of, again, silver or lead iodide, and they were ignited to release those particles into the clouds. And when the rest of the world found out what the U.S. was doing, uh, they tried to ban the use of geoengineering as a weapon. It's called the European Modification Convention and it's designed to prevent military tactics that would control the weather. But rogue nations and terrorist groups aren't going to abide by any international agreement. Um, and so there may come a time when geoengineering could deprive a, an enemy nation of rain while allowing a re abundant rainfall to fall on their allies or their own soil and denying it to their enemy. And maybe the 
Day will even come when violent storms can be directed to fall on enemy troops or heavy rains to prevent maneuvers or cold and excessive snow to hinder the adversaries while allowing mild winter conditions to benefit yourself. I don't know. That surely could happen. So how does that figure into Bible prophecy? Well, I can't say with great specificity, but many of the plagues in the book of Revelation are ecologic disasters. And our global warming and, and our attempts at controlling the weather could backfire on us, and they could be the fuel that's used to, to be some of those plagues. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there are seven last plagues, and those vary from diseases to intense heat to drought, and then even a shower of deadly hailstorms. So, yeah, I could see that this potentially could fold into prophecy. I don't have an exact um, answer for you, but I think that is certainly a possibility and one that I think deserves further study. Thank you for the question. Sister Julia, I see we've had one come in here tonight. Why do you use the word rapture as several denominations do when it is not mentioned in the Bible? Why do I use the word rapture? Uh, <clears throat> I do that for convenience. The word rapture or the Latin word raptero is not in the Bible. But the description of a catching away of the overcomers is certainly there. You find it in First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and afterwards we that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a description of what most of the Christian world calls the rapture. Again, it's a translation from Greek into Latin, and then we use the Latin word reptero. Uh, you find a description of it also in the in the 15th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. And there's certain words that, that have uh, meaning, particularly to some of the people that are asking me these questions. Uh, when they use that word rapture, I will use it in answering the question. And not everyone who who ask these questions is, is as skilled in the scriptures as maybe some of you are. And so we want to be sure and try to answer these questions in a way that uh, can be understood by, by everyone. I try my best. Maybe I you know, don't always succeed, but I try my best to present these in, in easily understood terms. And there's no sin in using the word rapture. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of words that I use that aren't in the Bible. Uh, uh, you know, the missiles is, is not in the Bible. Uh, Russia is not in the Bible. Well, there's just so many words that we use that aren't in the Bible, but they explain things that are biblical. Uh, I could always say Magog instead of Russia. I could always say Togum, Togarma instead of Turkey, but sometimes it's just easier to use words that people understand today. So if that is in any way offensive, I apologize. I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but I want to describe what the Apostle Paul described in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and in other places like uh, Revelation 12 where the man-child is caught up to God. That catching up is a rapture. Uh, it is what we're trying to describe when we use that term. But thank you for that question. <clears throat> then I had one come in late this afternoon asking if Palestine and Philistines are the same. And who are the Palestinians and what's their origin? Well, the region, the, the Holy Land, has gone by many names throughout time. It was called the Land of Canaan. It's been called a lot of different things. But over the course of time, and particularly among the Romans, they would refer to that land as Palestine, which is just a corruption of the word Philistine, because part of that land was the land of the Philistines. Um, and then they would call it uh, Judea after, after the tribe of Judah. Um, we call it Israel today after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. It's gone through a lot of names, uh, but, but one of those names is Palestine which is really a corruption of Philistine. Now there are 
Arabs there who are called Palestinians. And my question asks, who are they and what's their origin? And that's really a complex question. Their origin is very diverse. Um, that region was not originally populated by Arabs, that is people whose, whose origin is in the land of Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, the Arabian Peninsula, that area. Um, these people were more indigenous to that area. They descended more from Canaanites, Philistines, but most prominently from Ishmaelites. Remember Abraham's son Ishmael from his uh, slave wife, uh, Keturah, uh, not Keturah, but uh, oh, H Hagar was her name. And Hagar is the progenitor of the Arab people. I can get you scriptures for that if you need. Uh, even in Hebrews, it refers to Agar um, and Arabia. And so the people in the area of Palestine are more descendant from Ishmael, to some extent Esau, maybe a little bit from Moab and Ammon, which are the children of, of Lot, who was a relative of Abraham. They're descendants of Abraham, but they're not the promised seed because they didn't descend from Isaac and from Jacob. Um, they all consider themselves Arabs, the Palestinians do, and the rest of the world considers them to be Arabs, even though their ancestors did not come from Arabia, most likely. But the connection as Arabs is more of a cultural thing. As the uh, Islamic religion began to conquer the Middle East, they brought Arab culture, they brought the uh, Arab language into that land. And so the Palestinians, not the Jews that were there, but the Palestinians that were there, as they adopted the Islamic religion, they also adopted the uh, Arabian language, they adopted the culture and the religion of the Arab people, and they do consider themselves to be Arabs, and as I said, the rest of the world also uh, believes them to, or calls them Arabs. Um, and probably there is some Arab lineage in there, Arabian lineage in there, but primarily and biblically, they're Ishmaelites. <clears throat> Next, please explain as to whether the Jewish people in the millions in other countries like U.S., Germany, and even Russia will ever return to Israel. Well, some of them will, but probably not all of them until after the return of the Lord. And you know, while Jews historically have been found all around the globe, uh, it's very concentrated today. Um, more than four-fifths of all Jews in the world live in just two countries, Israel and the United States. I tried to get statistics on this, and I've, there was not agreement, but, but at least one source said that 41% of all Jews live in Israel and 41% live in the United States. Together, those two countries make up more than 80% of all the Jews in the world. Now, other studies put the estimate that says there's 15.3 million Jews in the world. A little over 7 million of them are in Israel, and a little over 6 million are in the United States. So again, that's more than 13 million out of the 15 million Jews in the world. That means that only 2 million Jews are scattered in nations other than the U.S. and Israel. You'll find much smaller numbers in other countries. Uh, the next highest after the U.S. and Israel is France, and it's less than half a million. Uh, 442,000 Jews there. Canada, 394,000. United Kingdom, 292,000. Argentina, 173,000, and the numbers drop off from there. Now, I doubt that all of those 2 million or plus the 6 million in the U.S., 8 million are going to move to Israel um, before the last prophetic hour and maybe not until after the return of the Lord. For one thing, life is still pretty good in the U.S. and in some other places. Um, but where anti-Semitism is bad or where it's rising, uh, where it's getting worse, a lot more Jews are likely to make that uh, what they call the Aliyah. The Aliyah is when you move permanently as a Jew to Israel. 
And if you are Jewish, at least if one of your four grandparents are Jewish, if you're 25% Jewish, then under the law of return, you are granted immediate citizenship when you come to Israel and they will accept you and incorporate you into, into Israeli society. But as I said, anti-Semitism can drive people there when the borders finally opened on the former USSR, the Soviet Union, and some of the East European nations, Jews by the thousands and almost a million uh, left because life was bad there and it was so much better for them in Israel. The rise of anti-Semitism in France and to some extent UK is causing other Jews to make the Aliyah. And we may see more of that as anti-Semitism continues to rise in the world. I mentioned it somewhat in the last Bible study. And then I believe once the Lord does establish his millennial kingdom, and there is peace in the Middle East forever, that's when I think all the Jewish people will return to the land that God gave them from the river of Egypt all the way to the great river, the river Euphrates. Sister Julia, another question. Is the prophetic office still at work today? How about the apostles? Is the prophetic office still at work today? How about the apostles? Well, the apostle Paul did tell us in the fourth chapter of Ephesians that when Jesus ascended on high, he gave gifts unto men. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. We believe that to be a five-fold ministry with five distinct offices in that ministry. Uh, one of those offices is, is a prophet. And there were times that, that in the early church there were prophets who could foretell the future, kind of like an Old Testament prophet. One of those was a man named Agabus. You read about him in the book of Acts. And he could foretell future events when the Spirit of the Lord anointed him. And, uh, but there's also a reference in, in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul was giving the order of the church service. And he said, let the, the prophets speak unto edification and exhortation and comfort. And what he was saying is that there's certain times that a man of God will be anointed. Maybe not to foretell the future and say, you know, in six months this is going to happen. But maybe he has a powerful anointing to, to exhort the people, to encourage the people, to edify them. That means to build them up in the most holy faith. Or to speak words that are comforting to them in their time of trouble and need. And that's definitely a ministry that I see today. It's very different from somebody who's standing and teaching. You can teach uh, doctrine, and that's a real gift too. Uh, pastoring is shepherding. That's encouraging and, and comforting and, and consoling and, and uh, protecting the sheep. But there's times when there's a powerful anointing on a man of God. And, and in that time, he's operating in a prophetic office. Now, I've gone through the qualifications for an apostle. And I personally believe that the church began with apostles to establish truth. And I believe the church age is going to end with apostles. I don't want to take the time here tonight to go through all of that, the qualifications of an apostle. Uh, am I not free? Have I not seen Christ? Are not you my, uh, the seal of my apostleship is you and the Lord. There are certain qualifications power to work miracles, power to speak authoritatively for the Lord in a way beyond that of a prophet. Um, when a, a man who speaks with the authority of, of Jesus Christ, uh, that's an apostolic gift, and I am looking for the restoration of that apostolic office. And as I said, I've talked about that several times and probably will do so again because it's a question that keeps coming up, and I think it's on people's minds. But there are qualifications for an apostle, and there's a reason that God will use apostles in a certain time. One thing that we have that the early church didn't, and they needed apostles because they didn't have a New Testament. We do. Now, we're going to need apostles in the end of this age, and I expect to see that office operating with specific authority as, a, uh, as an apostolos, oh, the Greek word a specially commissioned spokesman for the Lord. And I think that's going to happen. But right now we have the advantage of having an entire New Testament, the 29 books of the New Testament, which the early church had to operate without. And so 
we may not need the apostle right now for the work we're doing right now as a body of Christ, but we are going to need that as the church finishes its mission. That's what I believe. <clears throat> and my next question, will Christians see the Antichrist or will the rapture, again that word rapture, occur before then? Will the catching away of the bride occur before then? Thank you. And that's not as straightforward a question as it might appear because what is the Antichrist? The Apostle John 2,000 years ago was writing 1 John and in chapter 2 and verse 18 of 1 John he said, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. What he's saying, it was the last days of the early church. It was going into apostasy. But there were already many Antichrists, not just one, but many in that day. He said in chapter 4 and verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Then in Second John, in verse 7, he said, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So there were many Antichrists in John's time. And I think in our time, and particularly as we come to the end of the church age, there are going to be many antichrists, many working in an operation that is directly contrary to what Jesus Christ is wanting and what Jesus is doing through his church. There are going to be many who resist the operation of the body of Christ. And yet, there is an antichrist. Uh, I think it goes by different names in the, in the Bible. Uh, you know, there's a false prophet that's referred to in the book of Revelation who's going to be active and evident in end-time events. I believe that is the Antichrist. It's referred to a couple, three times, I think, in Revelation. One of those is in Revelation 16. In verse 13, it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And that false prophet is a miracle worker because it says in Revelation 19 and verse 20, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Uh, a great miracle worker. Uh, he's called a foolish shepherd in Zechariah 11:15. The fact that he's referred to as a prophet and as a shepherd in the Bible indicates to me a religious leader a claim to be some type of a clergyman. And yes, I do believe he'll be on the scene operating before the catching away of the bride. Maybe not in complete fullness, but certainly in some form. And will be acclaimed as a peacemaker, bringing peace to the Middle East. We certainly don't see that peace today. But eventually, there's got to be what Ezekiel 38 refers to as a land of unwalled villages, a land that's at peace that's taken by a great surprise. And I think the Antichrist, the Antichrist, not an Antichrist, but the Antichrist, the false prophet, the foolish shepherd, uh, will appear as a great religious leader and conquer by diplomacy rather than by force of arms and bring a semblance of peace uh, for a period of time during the last prophetic hour. But it's going to be a false peace. And it's going to be a peace that will be interrupted by the rapid buildup and the beginning of the Battle of Armageddon. As people will say, peace and safety, but sudden destruction will come upon them. And I think that we have to be aware that there's going to be an Antichrist and many Antichrists. And that's why we need what Jesus called the Spirit of Truth in the book of Revelation so that we're not deceived, because iniquity shall abound. The love of many will wax cold, Jesus said in John 24. I mean in Matthew 24, pardon me. Matthew 24. Iniquity is going to abound, and people are going to be deceived. And Jesus one time said, if it were possible, the very elect will be deceived. 
I'm glad it's not possible, but you want to be sure you're one of those very elect and that you have that spirit of truth operating, that you're not deceived by the spirit of Antichrist that's going to be just as active at the end of the church age as it was the beginning of the church age when the Apostle John wrote to warn about those Antichrists. So I thank you for the questions that you've submitted. I hope that these answers have been somewhat helpful. I invite you to submit questions either as messages to our page or as comments to this particular post, and we will then try to address those questions in an upcoming Bible study session. But I want to mention that there will not be a Bible study next Tuesday. Uh, I think that's the first, oh no, that's the 31st of October. Um, I will be in a minister's meeting in Little Rock, the Lord willing, and so I won't be able to do a Bible study next Tuesday, October 31st, but we'll try to pick up again the following Tuesday as we enter into the month of November. Until then, I pray that the Lord's grace and mercy will be upon you, and thank you for your interest in the Holy Word of God. Amen.